don't want to freak anyone out, but what is that in front of us? HMS Duncan is a billion pound warship. On a brand new mission. I'm closing my position, clarify your intentions. You've seen the news, you know what's going on. Britain is sending a second warship to the Gulf as tensions rise. This is what we're here for. This Royal Navy destroyer is packed with the most advanced weaponry in the world. Now, a sea viper missile system is secret. By the time they're 50 feet above the ground, they're going three, four times the speed of sound. But 260 men and women also call it home. Like a married couple, but with no benefits whatsoever. So hopefully in the summer I'll come back. I love you. With exclusive access, our cameras have been invited back for Duncan's dramatic new seven-month deployment. Something's about to happen. It is a bit of a tense time. Illuminate contact at 390. So we're going to war. It is scary. As the crew joined the fight to eradicate ISIS in Iraq and Syria. This is as close as you get to being on the front line. Get ready for the worst scenario. Your future at the minute is not certain. And they find themselves at the heart of an international crisis. We are not here to start a war with Iraq. We might be here to finish one. This is as serious as it gets. Previously. Smile away, boys. Smile away. <laughs> HMS Duncan set sail from Portsmouth. Oh, look, we're back at Mamas now. For a rendezvous in the eastern Mediterranean. <laughs> to take part in the war against terror groups in the Middle East. It's 6.45 a.m. HMS Duncan is two weeks into her seven-month deployment. I've been doing this for just over 10 years now. I'd like to say I was, I was used to it, but I I'm still, still feel like I'm always tired. Ben Dorrington has been serving on Duncan for almost two years. He's one of the ship's most senior officers. I liked the idea of, of, of joining up. I didn't really want to work a nine-to-five office job in London. I enjoy my job, which is good, because it's not something that a lot of people can say. The good bit about it is you never know what your next operational tasking might be. As principal warfare officer, Ben is at the heart of Duncan's operations. Jill and Rig for action station today will be PCS carrying back the bags. This is the ops room. This is effectively the, um, the nerve centre of the ship. It is supplied by some of the most powerful uh, naval radars in the world. And these radars allow us to see for hundreds of miles in uh, any direction. They can detect and track more enemies than anyone else and at longer ranges than any other warship. HMS Duncan has now begun her role on Operation Inherent Resolve, an international mission to attack ISIS-held territory. Her job is to enforce a 10-mile exclusion zone around the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle, giving her jets enough space to conduct bombing runs over Syria. But two Russian warships, the Severomorsk and Admiral Essen, are also nearby. All positions continue to report uh, unknown 8745. It seems they might not be the only Russian activity in these waters. Correct, 8745 remains at unknown 8745. Now 46 uh, nautical miles, uh, 090, unknown 8745. Ben's just seen something suspicious on the radar screen. Okay. Roger. 
he thinks it could be a Russian submarine. Thank you. I'm just letting a kilo be pottering around, doing what he wants to do. And he informs the captain. You get that off, Swatch. So possible submarine detected. That's what you do. Can you get hold of everybody that should be up there, please? Yeah. Full defence watch. We certainly got some warning that there's a submarine out there. They're incredibly stealthy. They're really very, very difficult to detect. And even with the sophistication of the, the kit we've got, they can sneak right into a test group and wreak havoc. The submarine presents the ultimate threat. If you think that the, the carrier is a is an airfield with roughly 30 aircraft on board, one torpedo, you could remove all of that uh, strike capability. In the same way as we're protecting her from surface units, we also provide that defence against the underwater threat. The captain needs to know if it definitely is a Russian submarine. An infallible way of identifying a submarine is with a competent observer. All the kit and sensors in the world, none of that beats an operator looking at a submarine. He's sending Duncan's Wildcat helicopter for a closer look. Possible submarine out there at the moment. So we are in a position where you can't let the submarine through and drive around and confuse it. That would be a real win to detect something positively and you could go straight to a search site based on looking at it. With conditions like it is today, it's a perfect day to get up high use the radar range, use the camera range. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Approved as briefed. Thanks. <clears throat> Time is of the essence. The helicopter needs to get airborne before Duncan loses the scent. All right, just ease forward a bit. Not bothered about anything off the top. Yeah. Just like, you know, fade in the shot as you can go on the sides. You got any gel in here or anything? Nah, I've got nothing in it at the minute. Unaware of events in the ops room, Kieran Whitty's taking some time out with Duncan's resident barber, Darren Shallow. Man, I'll sort you out. Don't worry. At 18 years old, Kieran's one of the youngest on board. This is his first deployment. I didn't really think of any other option. I just thought the Navy or nothing else. It is a bit overwhelming. Everything's like you like your whole life to schedule. And it's like you're eating at this time, between meal times you're doing this, you're just getting told what to do. So that's a big shot. The worst thing for me is like being away when stuff's happening at home, like family stuff. So don't block it out, but I try not to think about it in too much detail because then you can you kind of think of what you are missing, and that's when people get homesick. Oh. I think I went a little bit high here, but don't worry, I could fix it. What do you mean? I think I think when I just did it there, your hair your head moved a bit, but don't worry, just come and see me in like a couple of days, or we can blend it back in, all right? Cliche, but that camaraderie of it just kind of gets you through, and just sort of being around people, even if you're not in the mood to be around people, just makes the time go quicker. Why wow, was you winding me up, was you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, I knew that. That way, that's the submarine. On the flight deck, the Wildcat helicopter is about to begin its hunt. They've put quite a lot of effort into always knowing where the submarines are, because um, they've got land attack cruise missiles on them. Um, so keeping uh, a really, really good handle on those is important. Uh, yeah, so we've got the camera. Um, let's see what we find. Having a submarine very, very close is clearly a danger for the French task force. If the submarine gets to within a firing range, first you'll know about it is that you get hit by the torpedo. Finding the suspected Russian submarine is top priority. I'm now to the northeast of Task Force uh, by approximately 90 nautical miles. 
It's now been two hours since Duncan's Wildcat helicopter was dispatched in search of a suspected Russian sub. Command attention is conduct surface search to the north. We're looking for a kilo. We don't know where they are at the moment, but be prepared uh, to pick those up at relatively short notice. In the ops room, Ben Dorrington's monitoring the hunt. The most difficult environment to understand what's happening is the underwater environment because you, you can't see it. So the way that the carrier has set up her anti-submarine warfare defence is in, is in layers. Uh, different units have got sonars on, there's helicopters in the air so that there is no chance of somebody getting close to the carrier without you knowing about it. Aircraft tracking left at 1,000 feet. The helicopter has just returned and they have news. Now, we spotted it, it was heading southwest. Um, it turned and started heading north toward the end of our source group. I've seen it close enough to be pretty damn sure. Looks Russian. Their cameras have captured pictures of a Russian submarine. This is a Russian kilo-class submarine, clearly routing from Syria back to Russia. We had a pretty good idea of, of, of roughly where it was. So, yeah, really pleased to get up there, get some footage of it, so they can continue to kind of understand who's where and who's doing what. The Russian sub appears to be moving away from HMS Duncan and Charles de Gaulle and heading back home to Russia. It poses no threat. Supposed to leave us ahead, 110. We've got that updated yet. Sub Lieutenant Jack Mercer is on his third tour of duty. 2885. Inspector? Yes, sir. My granddad was in the, uh, in the Merchant Navy for, for most of his youth and the stories that would always come out from him about where he'd been, you know, pictures from, from Tokyo, from San Francisco, it made me think that's a, that's a pretty good way of, of seeing the world. As a fluent French speaker, Jack's becoming Duncan's liaison officer. He's being sent to the French aircraft carrier to watch the airstrikes from the deck. The last person I know who did one of these he thought he was going over for six hours to a US ship. Um, he just went in what he was wearing, didn't take anything with him, and he ended up staying for a week and a half. So it was a bit embarrassing. He had to walk around in US uniform for the whole time and only one pair of pants. So I'm not going to make that same mistake. And I'm going to pack as if I'm just not coming back. Jack will be there as Charles de Gaulle makes a final push against the remnants of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. quite different type of ship from what I'm used to, the scale of the operations that it's doing, and the fact that we're going to be within range of Syrian missile sites. And it's going to be a very different mindset. Before those strikes happen, the crew are being given some downtime. The aim of the game is similar to netball, where the team scoring the most goals in a bucket is deemed the winner. Any questions? Good. First team's up. I don't know which one's mine, no. 20-year-old Connor Moore is in the third week of his seven-month deployment. Hopefully the beer actually fits me this time, so I'll get in early. <laughs> Globo Jim versus Boom Boom Shake the Room. We need bigger bibs, man. Any kind of a bigger one? The boom tube. The state in me, lad. <laughs> He's using every opportunity to get fit. When I joined the Navy, I was, I was, in, I was in good shape, you know, I, was, I was fit. And then put on three stone, I was massive. Oh, man, easy pass. I'm wasted talent here. My mum, she had like a big talk about, about how she's worried about me and all that. And I said, I'll get rid of it on deployment, I'll get rid of it on deployment. Go on, then. Oh, there we go. Hey. Good I was 112 when we left, 100 now. 
We'll have, we'll have six pack by the time we get home. Feel sick now. It's just a bit of downtime with the, with the lads, and obviously yeah, everyone gets to let their hair down and stuff, get out in the sun. <laughs> Everyone's laughing them, aren't they? And there's no rank when it comes to doing stuff like this, so you can kind of not worry about dressing people as the, the ranks and stuff. So you see a side to everyone else that like you wouldn't normally see. Let's get this quarters brief done. HMS Duncan is about to take part in the most challenging day of their mission to date. This is going to be the busiest watch that we've seen uh, thus far with our time with the Charles de Gaulle. There's a large uh, deck cycle from the carrier expected to be airborne at 13.30. That is aircraft going into Syria. Ben Dorrington is getting the ops room ready. The final wave of airstrikes on ISIS targets are about to begin. Quite a lot of moving parts, so I need everybody in here absolutely on the ball, giving their 100% attention throughout the next four hours. The Sevra Morsk, whether it's uh, by intention, is right in the way of the Charles de Gaulle's uh, flying course. That's another level of complication that we have to work through today. Everybody happy with that? Good, let's get on with it. Russian warships are dangerously close to entering the 10-mile exclusion zone around Charles de Gaulle. Ben must keep one eye on them and the other on the French jets. We're trying to maintain a safety buffer between the, the Russian forces and the um, carrier strike group. And at the same time, we conduct all of the surface and air operations. It's just a, an additional level of, of complication. Sub-Lieutenant Jack Mercer has been on Charles de Gaulle for the last 48 hours. You can feel the jet going up no matter where you are on the ship. So if you're six decks down below, it sounds like it's going above your head. The first time I heard it, I had about 10 jets go through the night. It was terrifying. I thought we hit something. Jack now has a front row seat as the final strikes against ISIS begin. I just find it amazing how quick they do it. This guy's coming on now, so you watch him do the sharp turn and then go on. There's a continuous uh, presence over Syria as well. Right now, we are just 30 miles off the coast of Syria, launching bombing missions against the Islamic State. This is as close as you get to being on the maritime front line. Back on Duncan, the engineers have spotted a problem. Then if you can see the little grey parts of the main mast there. So we've had um, a leak from the gearbox on our main nav radar. Trainee Kieran Whitty's been given the job of helping to keep the navigation radar operational. Without it, Duncan can't sail. Is there any residue around the other side? Yeah. There is? Quite a bit, yeah. I need some new rags over it. Yeah. But obviously, the risk is that if we lose too much oil, it could seize up, um, and then we'd lose the full capability of that radar. Yeah, it'd be very critical if we were to lose um, the radar itself. It is a, a ship stopper. Keeping the radar going is now mission critical.
ship pads for a port launch four through eight. In the ops room, Ben Dorrington's watching his screen fill with French jets. Fourth one's just gone off the deck now, uh, and they've got one, two, three. I think it's 11 to go up in total in a roughly 20 minute period. So there's quite a lot of aircraft so, so far. Everything's worked out in accordance with the plan. He's tracking each one as they head towards their ISIS targets. Ops one ship, give a good look out. Your red 105, now one possible radio ring closing the carrier. Hold her now. 154 knots, 3,000 feet. But something else has just appeared. A helicopter has come out of nowhere. Hold her on the deck, AC. Hold her on the deck. And it's flying straight at the aircraft carrier. HMS Duncan is on high alert, defending the French aircraft carrier, Charles de Gaulle. All positions, listen in. There's a 10 mile exclusion zone around the carrier. So 26 miles inbound. And an unidentified helicopter is fast approaching it. Oswald continues to close. Uh, Oswald period, come left at 290. Ben Dorrington's trying to find out where it came from and what its intentions are. Radio ring closing the carrier, hold her now. 154 knots. If it gets much closer, the French carrier could be at risk. Come to 110, so watch. Warning two now being read to the aircraft. Time to go 10 minutes. Still nothing visual, so watch. No response, sir, warning two. Roger, no response, warning two. The captain is called to the ops room. You've got ops control. Four quick squad. Transmit all round. The crew must be prepared to shoot it down. Quick draw, quick draw, quick draw, quick draw. Port side, threat is airborne, port side. Public when it's up. I'm the same on the other. Connor Moore is readying Duncan's anti-aircraft guns. Is that it? Get inside. Come on, come inside, come inside, come inside. SPS PO, let's get the port EOS back on this now. Laser's free. The ops room need to identify the helicopter before the threat increases. The threat is on the start speed, remains green one zero. Yeah. 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 Uh, visual. Right. Visual from the helicopter now started on the fourth side, engage side, fourth side. Green at 130, descending the high inbound. Ransom of the rounds, through just so it's ready to fire, just in case. The guns are locked and loaded. Personnel are not involved in the quick draw. Clear off the upper deck. Clear off the upper deck, yeah. Upper deck weapons teams only. Viper AWO, cover 1662. A message has just been received. The helicopter has finally made contact. It's not a military threat. It's a commercial flight heading to Israel. A firm confirmed neutral 0640. This has been foolish by flying over the top of the force. Stand down at quick draw. Stand down at quick draw. Stuff was on there. P3S3 reports, stood to. Inside now, starboard side. What happened there was a civilian helicopter just blundered into the force, having probably not checked his. Uh, Checked his charts properly. To us, that's starting to show some pretty dangerous behaviour. He certainly put himself in a position where, at the very best, he could have interrupted the Charles de Gaulle. He probably doesn't even realise what's just happened. You know, and if he does, and he didn't respond to warnings, then he's a fool. P5S5, unload. 
And relax. <laughs> this is the closest Connor's been to military conflict. I'm going to shit myself then, like, because it's, it's just like it's dead instant, isn't it? So, um, I don't know, everyone, I think everyone just switches on then. Um, and there's just a lot of running around. That's the first, that's the first time I've done any of, any of that then. Um, preparing the phalanx for a quick draw, like, that's the first time I've done it, so I didn't have, actually have a clue what I was doing. I was just following orders. With the airstrikes over, the ship can return to normal duties. I'm just planning the route into Limassol, which I'm doing as part of my development for my command board next month. Lieutenant Joe Peacock uh. is the ship's most senior female warfare officer. This is Wectis, which is like sat nav for the sea. And uh, it doesn't have the voice, though, which is annoying. That'd be really cool. Turn right at the next boy. Uh, it doesn't do that, which would be really helpful, because then I wouldn't have to do all of this, but I do. Today is the next step in her career, as she tries to qualify to become captain of her own warship. She came to me requesting that she practiced her navigation skills as the navigator to set her up then for her command assessment. Joe's navigating the ship into Cyprus for a planned stop, but she has an extra problem to deal with. There's a fault with the navigation radar at the moment. Navigation safety is critical. A team are working really, really hard to try and keep us going. If the radar was to break down, Joe's fear is that she will be driving into port blind. Pilotage in restricted waters is one of the most dangerous things that a ship will do. And that's basically because you can either run aground or drive into another ship. I'm a strong, confident navigator. I will not hit any of these ships that I was not expecting to be here. Starboard 20. Starboard 20. Altering 296. Having everyone looking at you and listening and when it's something that you're not hugely confident in, it's quite difficult. Flag here on the ensign on the back of their naval ship. Is that going in the same direction as the berth? Uh, quite nice light, light wind as well. Yeah. yeah. Enough there to play with, but not too much. Duncan must be parallel parked alongside the French aircraft carrier, who is also here to refuel and resupply. There's actually a bit more space than I thought there'd be. I don't want to say it too soon, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the carrier would stick out a lot more. Very good. Two and a half cables to reload, is there? Roger. <clears throat> a common metaphor that people in the Navy use is, is you've got to pretend to be a swan. You've got to look all cool on the surface, but be paddling madly underneath. And, and that's, that's what most people aim for. You've got to not fake it, but you've got to ooze the confidence that puts everyone else at ease and, uh, and, and get on with it. Not got vision on the flag, sir. No, I don't think there is. Port quarter swinging clear, sir. So the bridge wings to uh, Black Bollard there. We're right now. Yeah, if it, we're just slowly walking on, aren't we? The ship arrives smoothly into port. It's a big tick ahead of Joe's command exams. He took a bit of coaching from Captain Navs to get the right information out of me, but safe, came in. A bit stressful at first, a bit nerve wracking, but once you get going, it's all right. So, yeah, I think so. it's all right. Because of how advanced it is and stuff, we're not allowed to take it to pieces. So it's just basically a straight swap in, swap out. With the ship in port, Kieran Whitty's replacing the faulty navigation radar. Because that kit's so important, so vital to what you're doing, when it's broken, it needs to get fixed quick. You haven't got much time, so everything's kind of sped up a bit, which that's a little bit exciting. Isn't it? If the repair goes wrong, Duncan won't be able to leave. 
effectively we need to do this to make the ship sail. So uh, Witty's helping with that, so yeah, it's quite important this morning. This one's got loads of paint in it, so I can't get the Allen key in. Yeah. Itty Witty's been on board for about three months. He's pretty good at what he does. Could be a little terror, but he's, he's actually keen, uh, interested. You've got the best job there, Witty. Uh, I'm doing it well now, the gaffer's here. So. Once the radar has been unscrewed, the heavy lifting equipment takes over. The pedestal itself weighs 66 kilograms, which is why we've got to crane it off. Because, uh, yeah, it's pretty heavy. Not for me. Not for me personally, that one's that heavy, but, I mean, for others it might be, so we have to use a crane to get it off. After 10 days away... Did you miss me? Jack Mercer's returning from the French aircraft carrier. You guys all right? It's kind of weird, you know, when you just come back. Yeah, I think I've got a lot to catch up on, see what they've been doing, so... Hello, Billy, you all right, mate? Good. Good, good. Loving being back, obviously. I've never set foot on, a, on an aircraft carrier before. To see that carrier engaged in live operations up close in real time. Yeah, it's a bit of an eye-opener. I believe there's literally no one around, which is really scaring me. Oh, no, what's it done? Right, the Liverpool scarf's still there. That's good. The bed's still here. <laughs> Where is he? Where is that chap? I can hear him. You hide in that bog roll. Yeah. We've missed out on Jack now for nearly two weeks, so we're sort of welcoming him back. <laughs> No, no, I mean, next one's fine. We're friends again, Jack. Calm down. Ceasefire. Ceasefire. All right. Oh, hi, mate. Hello, mate. How How How's it going? <laughs> Jack's return coincides with the arrival of the post. Loads of morale. All the morale. That's what people wait for. This is the first delivery since the ship left Portsmouth. My nan has reinforced this pretty well. Jack has something to open too. My mum and my nan send me quite random things. She's like this with Christmas presents as well. And they always leave a nice soppy message right on the side of the, the box just to make sure everyone gets a laugh when it arrives in the wardroom. They'll send me stuff that I used to eat as a kid, mainly. Lots of crisps, lots of food, noodles, and... Uh, and yeah, all right, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, it's always nice to get something free. That'll keep me going for about two days. Up on deck, Kieran Whitty's finished his work on the radar and the ship is ready to head to sea. We've got it all fitted in. Everything's plumbed in all the internals, all the covers back on, just doing the final touches now, like the wires and stuff. Um, and the next stage is for us to do our setting to work. So we'll check it works and then we'll program it in for the ship. And that's it, really. Big thumbs up. And we'll go sun it up and live the dream. Navigation safety is critical at all times, no matter what mission you're doing on a ship. The engineers have done a really impressive job of restoring this capability, and particularly E.T. Whitty, you know, a very junior engineer who's taken this thing by the horns and, and solved the problem. HMS Duncan is three weeks into her seven-month deployment. We need to work out uh, a number of elements to this. There are a number of moving parts. But top secret orders from the UK are about to change their plans. About an hour ago, the ship received a warning order to be prepared to support a non-competent evacuation operation. There are approximately 33 personnel ashore, uh, and there are rebel forces advancing on at the moment. Duncan must now prepare for a high-risk rescue mission. HMS Duncan has just received orders to prepare to rescue 33 British personnel from a secret location. 
this is in-house, um, this is not to go outside of the ship. Induct effectively static MMPU duties. Paul Caddy is the ship's executive officer. As second in command, it's fallen to him to brief the heads of department. So right now we're after what's the essential stuff that we need to get on board the ship to be able to do it, and is there any absolutely critical commander's information requirements that we need to pull forward to facilitate this as an op? This is very much to the captain, can we do this, and what are the essentials to determine our success in this operation? Duncan's most senior team need to make plans for the new mission, but they must do so without letting news get out to the rest of the crew. Certainly, navigator's going to be working out how long it's going to take us to get there because we're several hundred miles away from the area that we're going to be operating in. Um, have we got enough fuel to get there? And it's all about articulating the risk and the tasks that will be required to achieve the mission. You know, we're a high-end warfighting unit. We, we are absolutely capable of doing operations like this. So, yeah, it's exciting in, in that, you know, you are doing the job that you've been trained to do. Most of the crew have no idea that the ship could soon be retasked. Fighting the war of dust and grime. This is the real war. Kieran Whitty's doing his daily chores. When you go through your training and stuff. You can like get picked up for fast track, which basically means uh, just get promotion through the ranks quicker. Eventually, I want to go officer because as you get promoted, the job gets better in the sense of the, the more responsibility and the more exposure you have to like specific bits of kit. And the navy will put you through an engineering degree, and then get to the dark side to become an officer. I've only just passed the course to use this. Still new. Still got a green license when it comes to using this thing. Provisional, provisional hooverer. I've looked at people who have do, done what I want to do, and I thought, if they're doing it, then then why can't I do it? Why don't Why don't I do that? I mean, once you've done the hoovering, then it depends what day of the week it is. Then we'll sometimes buff it as well, and and they're the important days. So obviously, if you don't get buffed, you know, the world stops turning. Executive Officer Paul Caddy has an update about the potential new mission. There are approximately 33 personnel ashore who don't have alternative means of extracting themselves from it. The broad intent is for HMS Echo to go alongside and extract the personnel. We will be very close in and extending an air defence umbrella to ensure that HMS Echo is protected while she is alongside. The joint mission with sister warship HMS Echo is highly sensitive, with 33 British lives at stake. As a result, Duncan must go into communications lockdown. Uh, and we'll go from there. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> we need to make sure that any information we pass doesn't get off the ship, so we raise what's called our River City State. That limits access to email, telephones, and other off-board communications so that we can maintain our operational security on our set. XSPD, assume relativity state two. This information is not, I repeat, not to leave the ship under any circumstances. Although the mission is top secret, the XO needs to tell his crew something. If it happens, they will all need to be prepared. Clear lower deck, clear lower deck of the whole ship company. Monster in the hangar. There's always a balance to be struck with this. If I keep secrets from them when I don't have to, it, it removes their ability to work for and with us. Hey, Duncans, how you doing? Around midday today, we received a warning order telling us to be prepared to conduct operations alongside HMS Echo. Conditions are sure they're deteriorating, uh, and one of the major rebel groups is advancing to try and take it away from the UN-recognized government. There may be a requirement potentially for us to take action there. We are at 48 hours notice to do that. I will give you more information as and when I get it. That is all.
HMS Duncan is waiting for an update on their sensitive new mission. Four band range, 240 yards steady. It's so secret, they've been unable to tell their French allies. But Duncan's time with Charles de Gaulle is now at an end. And the ships are taking part in a naval farewell. So this is a um, excellent way to finish the deployment with the French, because you can see um, how much sheer metal is close to each other. Excellent fun, but they're going to crack on our in detail uh, national task and completion, so it's a great way to finish. It's excellent. Race the carrier now 600 yards opening. This hasn't been play acting, it hasn't been war games, this has been genuine integration into a mission uh, which has got an, an end state and a, and a goal. The result of the airstrikes is now filtering through to the public, following President Trump's claims of victory over ISIS. You know, we took over the caliphate, you'll see it tonight. This is a map in 2016, everything red is ISIS. Now, on the bottom, there is no red. This just came out 20 minutes ago. We provided protection to the carrier while she's been launching live bombing operations in Syria, so it's been a really, really important job. From my point of view as, as a CO, it's, it's just great to see the team um, responding to that challenge. It's really impressive to watch. So yeah, dead chef for the team, they've nailed it. It's been a learning curve for me because I've got that chance to be exposed to what you see in the news, but first-hand what's really happening. So it's a good experience. It's, it's definitely something I'll be able to take on and say something, it's something I've done. People are paying attention to this. It's quite nice to know that the effort that you're putting in as a ship isn't going unnoticed. And I'm really glad that we, we've been lucky enough to be in that position. HMS Duncan is now on her own. Right, OK. OK, cool. Thanks. Cheers, boy. The captain has just received an update from the UK about the planned secret mission. It looks as though the task has gone. What it does demonstrate, I think, is the need to be ready for what could be quite intense and serious missions. But right now, we're going to stand down. Bit of an anti-climax. Below decks, news is spreading that the covert rescue mission is off. Not, not, not really happened, does it? It's no. like getting told you're going to Disney World and then you go to one in Paris. It's like that. It's, it's been that sort of anti-climax, to be honest. <laughs> Still Disneyland Paris, isn't it? It's not the American one, the full fat version. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> The order to stand down means the crew can turn their attention to other matters. Kieran Whitty's been called to the captain's cabin. When you hear your name, shout, sir, march in. Stop at the ledge if you need to, and then step over, then carry on marching. His work on the radar has helped him win an early promotion. Means business. That means business. All this cups on. E T W E Whitty, sir. Salute. Requestman, stand at eight. Well, first of all, you win the prize so far for the most confident response to oh, my call much, and the strongest march and the best salute. And what I see from you is, joined the 21st January, recently selected Fast Track from the 31st of March, which I'm sure you're delighted with, working hard on sensors, including a really crunchy radar swap in Cyprus. But congratulations, well done. Straight through to one star. Get your sewing kit out, wear that with pride. Well done. Approves. Sir, so, E.T. W.E. Witty, to be rated, E.T. W.E. 1. Salute. Good, obviously, getting in front of the captain. So I'll probably, yeah, yeah, give him a ring, tell him about it. I'm sure she'll be happy. Quick march. Carry on, please. Thank you. So it's quite cool. Next time. About five, ten minutes ago, one has started heading down towards us. HMS Duncan is stalked by mysterious Russians in the Black Sea. We're on a billion pound warship and looking out the window, trying to work out what we think it is. Who heads up the military side of the armed forces? Uh, is he a yeah. prince? No, he's not. 
Engineer Meg faces a tough test. It is so important that I don't fail this because I'm not really sure what I'd do. Seized in a major escalation of tensions, the Stena Impero, a British flag tanker and its 23 crew members. And Duncan is ordered to the Gulf. The ante is now going up and it's time for a real warship to step in and if needs be, bring the fight to the Iranians.